you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and to uh, talk about my project. Um, I would like to start um, by also acknowledging the Ghana people whose land is that I am on today. And before I get into my presentation, uh, a bit of background about myself. I am actually from a genetics background uh, rather than the, um, I guess, ecology side of things. Um, but I've always had such a passion for animals and conservation and trying to sort of tie all these different areas together. So I think this, this uh, collaborations and partnerships um, session is actually a really good fit uh, for me personally. So to get you into the uh, swing of things about echidnas, I wanted to share a little bit about their amazing biology. So to start, echidnas are seasonal breeders. So they only, you'll only find them um, uh, in the wild in these groups uh, during breeding season, which happens between June and September every year. And this time of year, you'll get, you'll see these things called echidna trains, where you'll find this one, uh, female leading the train and then she's followed by all of these males all trying to compete with her to make with just her so these trains can last for several weeks at a time um, and be incredibly long uh, and then eventually the female will choose a male to mate with so after she has fallen pregnant she does what very few mammals do and that's lay an egg so echidnas and platypuses are very notorious for being the only egg laying mammals in the world um, and we are very lucky to have them and that's only one of the amazing things that we know about their biology. So the baby echidna will stay inside of the egg for only 10 days and then it will hatch and if you look at your thumbnail right now that is the size of this baby newborn hatchling echidna. Absolutely tiny um, and always remarkable biology that we find out about these guys. So after about a month and a half of being uh, inside of the mother's pouch, it grows up to look a little bit like this, which is, you can see um, the spines are forming here. So as you can imagine, that wouldn't be very comfortable for the mama echidna to be carrying around this uh, baby anymore. So what she does is she puts it into a nursery burrow and it stays there for um, another several months. She only comes back once every five days to feed it milk and then it's old enough to start foraging by itself uh, and then goes on to make its own little breeding cycle. So even though echidnas are such iconic animals, especially here in Australia, um, we know very little about their wild populations and that's because echidnas are really difficult to actually study out in the wild. Um, which makes it really hard for us then to figure out how they're going and uh, what we can do to help with their conservation. The only well-studied population is the one that is on Kangaroo Island down here. And that is only because of the work by uh, Dr. Peggy Reese Miller. She has both lived and worked on Kangaroo Island for the past 30 years studying echidnas. And because of her work, um, we know so much more about their biology, about their natural life history, just like the events that I was talking about earlier. Um, but also we now know that they are endangered. And echidnas on Kangaroo Island face the exact same threats as the rest of the uh, rest of Australia. So, you know, it, there's uh, threats such as feral animals like cats and foxes. There are massive roadkill issue, um, as well as just general habitat loss. So we know these things are happening on mainland Australia, but because we don't have the data to support that, they're still listed as least concern, which is an issue for conservation purposes because if there's no threatened species listing, that means that there's no government support, there's no money that goes into um, to, uh, their survival uh, and no proper conservation management plans um, developed for them. So we wanted to change that. Um, but how do you get Australia-wide information on an animal that's really difficult uh, to study? And so that's where Echidna CSI came about. Um, because basically we were having conversations with people and they were saying that they saw them all the time popping up in their own backyards or when bushwalking. And so we're like, why hasn't anyone collected this data before? Why don't we use the power of thousands of people rather than us small research groups trying to gather this sorts of information? So to do this uh, work, we developed an app also called Echidna CSI for people to download. And so we asked people to do a few things. Firstly, is to record a sighting of echidnas wherever um, they may be. 
Um, and so because it's through an app, it automatically tracks the date, the time, the location for us. Um, and we also ask a few questions about the, um, the action and the biology of the echidna itself. People also have the option to submit old sightings through the app as well, as long as it's been taken through a smartphone device. Um, and lastly, which is, I guess, the more interesting side of things, is that we also ask people to collect echidna poo for us. There is a very good reason for that. It's not just for the fun of it. Um, and that comes down to my genetics background. So echidna poo, or any animal poo really, has an abundance of DNA and hormones inside of those scat samples, which gives us the opportunity to find out not just about where echidnas are located, um, but gives us a whole range of information. So for example, from the DNA, we're able to see um, the DNA from the food that they've eaten. So echidnas are sort of notoriously labeled as ant and termite eaters, but there is some evidence to suggest that they eat quite a range of insects um, and not just insects, but also potentially plants and fungi. Um, so we wanted to be able to, I guess, characterize that a little bit more. Um, you can also get the DNA from the echidnas themselves, which then leads to the possibilities of looking at population genetics and how they're related to each other in different areas. There's also the bacteria, uh, the, the DNA from the bacteria living inside of the echidna's gut. And uh, the microbiome is a very big buzzword at the moment. And so it gives us a lot of information about um, their biology and their health um, through looking at uh, the, the bacteria. And through the hormones, there's actually a lot of um, hormones that get excreted out into the scats as well. So stress hormones can be measured. So if, you're, if you've got a high level of cortisol in your scat compared to a normal level, that means that you're pretty stressed. Um, and also you can have a look at reproductive hormones as well. So the, the field of looking at or using scats as a way to um, find out more about wildlife isn't a new concept. Um, it's been around for uh, decades and it has been more and more popular with the uh, genomic tools that we're that are becoming more and more readily available. But putting this into a context of citizen science um, hadn't really been done before. And so we didn't really know how it would go. It was sort of like a, let's see if people would collect poo for us <laughs> and go from there. Um, so now that you know a bit about the structure of the project, I want to introduce you to I guess this first level um, of partnerships and collaborations that has made this possible and that's across different scientific disciplines. So firstly, my supervisor, uh, Frank Grutzner, uh, he is the leading monitoring geneticist in the world, um, has been doing some amazing work for the past uh, 15 or so years, um, especially in terms of things like the platypus genome project. We also have the echidna genome. Um, sequence now that is available for us to uh, look more at a um, the genetic side of echidnas and really when I came to him for my PhD I was like I want to do something with mammals and genetics I like to put a conservation spin on it and he was like cool I haven't done that before but I want to go into that space let's do it <laughs> so I think one of the best things that I've learned from him as a supervisor is just following your passions and your interests and finding ways to do it. So we were all going into this very blind um, with uh, support from the community, of course, um, but it really was a, let's see and <laughs> see how it goes, which has worked in our favor. So secondly is uh, Dr. Peggy Reese Miller, as I mentioned before, she is the leading echidna ecologist um, and has been um, do, uh, collaborating with Frank for, for quite a while. Um, and is, is quite close friends. And so having her on board really makes the links from the genetics and from the molecular biology to the true echidna biology possible. Without her, I wouldn't know half the amount of things about echidnas because she has just such a wealth of knowledge about just how they work and they run. And lastly is uh, Alan Stenhouse. So he sort of made sure that this project actually got up and running because he is the one that developed the app for us. So we started this project over three years ago. So iNaturalist wasn't really a thing back then. And so having an app that people could actually download and to submit these sightings was incredibly important for us. Um, and he really has driven that and made it possible for us to move forward. So being able to combine these aspects of molecular biology, ecology, and even software and app design has made everything as possible as it has. So to 
create um, the buzz for this project because it is an Australia-wide project. Um, we have leaned very heavily on the media and the media has also loved us, which has been a really great um, <laughs> thing for us. Um, so when we launched the project, we had major news crews come out um, as to try and get as much coverage of this for Australia-wide as possible. Um, a bit about this day was that we were planning to, uh, so we we're recording this at the at Adelaide Zoo to try and get some footage of the echidna that lives in the enclosure. And could we find it? No. So <laughs> they had been there for a, probably over an hour and we could not find this echidna anywhere. And it really set up the reason that we really needed the citizen science side of things, because if we can't find an echidna in, the, in an enclosure where it's meant to be, um, we have been struggling a lot <laughs> out in the wild. So over the past three years, um, we've had, I am constantly doing radio interviews. Um, echidnas, uh, people find echidnas super fascinating, which has made this project um, as big as it is, which is wonderful. Um, as well as the news articles just uh, continue to come. Just two wow. more minutes, Talia. Okay, all right, I'll go really quickly. Um, online, we have a lot of, um, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, and we are in high contact with our um, citizen scientists and also in-person talks we give a lot of. Um, so secondly, obviously this, uh, the partnership is with the citizen scientists themselves. So they have made a world of difference for us being able to do the science that we're doing right now. So Echidna CSI has been, uh, had over 10,000 app downloads and we're coming up to a 10,000 sightings and have over 500 scats collected for us. Um, so these are the sightings of the echidnas um, that have come in so far. As you can see, it is um, a lot more around heavily human populated areas, which is what we sort of expect to happen with the citizen science project. Um, but the most remarkable thing is the location of the echidna scats. So I reiterate that there is absolutely no way that we would be able to collect these sorts of specimens in these types of locations, especially in a three year um, PhD project, let alone then building up the um, methods to actually look at the DNA. So from over the past couple of years, um, we have been able to show that we can get good quality DNA from these citizen science collected scats. Uh, and it has allowed us to actually look um, at the DNA uh, inside of the uh, scats to look at the diets across different habitats. And we have been the first to be able to characterize the wild echidna microbiome. And uh, what that means is that we have now also been allowed to, or able to look at things like impact of bushfires. So as we all know, the Kangaroo Island bushfires were um, devastating. And so we have a lot of samples um, collected prior to the bushfires, which is in the green locations here, um, thanks to the Echidna CSI being up and running for the past three years. But we also now have mm. all these sightings, uh, uh, sorry, these scats from um, both inside and outside of the fire affected areas. And we're actually seeing quite a dramatic um, change in their microbiomes from the after the bushfires. So that's really interesting and very new stuff that we're working towards. Very, very lastly, sorry, I'll be quick. Um, <laughs> the third thing I wanted to very briefly talk about is uh, cross-institutional collaborations we've had as well. So we work quite closely with both Persu and Taronga Zoo, um, and especially to do with their diet. So as you can see here, echidnas have fed this gruel-like substance, which absolutely is not what their uh, diet is out in the wild, but you can't really just give them hundreds of thousands of ants every single day in a captive setting. So there's been a lot of work done to have a look at um, getting diets to make sure that the echidnas are as healthy as possible and to help with captive breeding as well. And so we've also been looking at the microbiome changes through that with the different diets. And because we've got the citizen science data, we can also compare that to the wild um, and how that all compares. So there's lots of layers to this and it's been wonderful and amazing. And thank you. Um, <laughs> sorry, I had to squeeze in the last bit. Um, 